Thank you, Dr. Rice. At this time, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for the conference, Dr. Sina Skelton. She is the director of the Great Lakes Equity Center. Dr. Skelton has more than 15 years of experience in the areas of systems change, school improvement, and educational equity, including work with the Michigan Department of Education. Dr. Skelton will speak to us on leading for equity, how leaders move beyond school improvement, to school transformation toward a just, inclusive, and quality education for all. Please join me in, doc in welcoming Dr. Sina Skelton. Good day. Hello, my name is Sina Skelton, and I am the Director of Operations for the Midwestern Plains Equity Assistance Center. It is my pleasure to be speaking with you all during your 2020 Michigan Continuous Improvement Conference. I want to first thank Superintendent Rice for inviting me to provide this keynote address. I want to kick off our, uh, this address by really taking time to unpack the title of the address. Leading for Equity, How Leaders Move Beyond School Improvement to School Transformation Towards a Just, Inclusive, and Quality Education for All. So we find ourselves in an interesting uh, place in time. We've just come through a very trying spring and summer. Um, many of us are still working remotely and learning remotely. And we're entering into a fall of uncertainty. And so when we think about continuous improvement, we're thinking about how do we center equity in a way that not only supports improving what we do, improving the nature of teaching and learning, but really to use this time to engage in reimagining or transforming our school communities so that they are just, so that they are inclusive, and so that everyone has equitable opportunity to engage in quality learning experiences. Reflecting, I would be remiss if I entered, if we, I continue with this discussion without really reflecting our current context. We've been through a lot again this summer. And what the intersection of the COVID-19 pandemic and the recent highly televised um, movement towards racial justice and addressing racial violence um, that we've witnessed across our country, this has brought really into high relief and highlighted the inequities in our communities, the inequities in our society, and the inequities in our schools. We are dealing with a lot, and our children are dealing with a lot. From disproportionate rates of COVID-related illnesses, and particularly communities of color, to increase incidence of racist acts against Black, Indigenous, and people of color, including our Asian American communities. The financial hardship and loss that many of our families and communities are experiencing due to job loss in response to COVID-19, many of our families are dealing with grieving the loss of loved ones. We've been socially isolated, forcing to sort of miss or postpone um, really important rites of passages that many of our students and many of our young people um, depend on as a matter of tradition. And we've experienced in our own living rooms through media protest against racism and the violence that we've seen in our communities, specifically towards communities of color. So this is the context that we're living in and the context that we think about, that we have to think about and we have to address when we're discussing issues of continuous improvement. So what does that mean? What does continuous improvement mean? in this context. What it means then is that we need to think about 
leadership in relationship in relation to social justice. As school leaders, how do we see our work and ourselves rooted in ed education justice? And what is the relationship between education justice and continuous, continuous improvement? Ed Taylor from the University of Washington um, provides this quote for us. And this is back in the 1990s where he conceptualized really the relationship of school leadership and social justice. He stated, the school leadership rooted in social justice has at its center tension, right? This at its center, at its very core, these conflicting realities, these tensions, and out of these tensions grow the motivation to reform education, to rethink education. We have to balance as school leaders these two juxtapositions between the ideal of what schooling ought to mean and ought to feel and look like, the ideal that schooling should be an experience that is affirming, that is responsive, that is supportive and inclusive for all students and for all educators, and the reality that for many of our students, many of our educators, many of the adults in our school communities are not experiencing this idea reality that we hold true. We have to balance as school leaders the tension between communities and students that are privileged, privileged by the practices that are in place, by the policies that are enacted, by the structures that are created, and those who are oppressed by those very same policies, practices, and structures. And at the center of that tension, the role of school leadership in dismantling those barriers. Dr. Taylor contends that education must have a social justice agenda. And that as school leaders, anchored and committed to social justice, must both be touched and moved by what we are experiencing and also possess the quality and capacity to touch and move others. And so over the years, not just now, not just recently, not just in our current context, but for more than 30 years, we've contended with these issues of oppression. We've contended with how racism and sexism and deficit thinking has manifested itself in our school's experiences and our school communities. And we've come together and we've implemented various different strategies to address the inequities produced by these systems of oppression. So we've tried initiatives like NTSS, like PBIS, Successful All, Restorative Practices. And while our efforts have been plenty and our efforts have been focused, for many of, for many of us, these efforts have not lend themselves to consistent and sustained improvements. And so why is that? And what do we need to do to transform our school communities from improving what's not working, what hasn't been working for many of our students, for many of our adults, to really transforming our school communities that work for everyone? Let's take a look at some data about how some students are experiencing schooling across the country, across the nation. Often when we look at data, we're presented with outcome data. And so I want to start with sort of painting the picture for us for how the ways in which our policies and practices have impacted many of our students. 70% of young people say they've 
seen bullying in their schools. And about 20% between the ages of 12 and 18 have experienced bullying directly. About 60% of our students who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer report feeling unsafe because of their sexual orientation. 85% feel unsafe because of their gender or gender expression. A study examining the race gap in school safety indicated that black students report feeling less safe compared to their white and Asian peers, even in the same school. And children with disabilities are disproportionately affected by bullying. Not only are some of our young people experiencing schooling conditions where they're feeling unsafe or unsupported, many of our adults are feeling the same way. Two qualitative studies recently published by the Education Trust found that Black and Latinx students, uh, teachers feel disrespected and deprofessionalized in their job, despite often exerting more emotional and actual labor than their colleagues. Educators who identify as LGBTQ plus felt as though their jobs are at risk if they were if they were to report feeling harassed and perceived that their school community was unsafe. Teachers with disabilities have reported being discriminated against, a feeling of isolation or exclusion because of their disability. And parents of color experience interactions with educators and other school personnel that message to them that school norms are superior to that of their home culture. And often these parents and caregivers feel silenced and face racial discrimination in their schools. So when we talk about the school community and we talk about the work that needs to be done, we know that we need to do work both in how our students are achieving, but also how our students and the adults in our systems are actually experiencing the schooling, the schooling experience. Let's look at some additional data. And I want to sort of highlight the differences between the data that I'm sharing with you today and some of the data that we're often presented with when we enter into conversations around issues of equity or inequities or school improvement. These data, these findings are focused on the conditions in which students are learning and the conditions in which teachers and educators are teaching. And I want to draw our attention to while the outcome data are important for us to understand, that in order to have a real deep understanding of what is producing the outcomes that we're seeing, we have to also understand the inputs or the conditions in which, in which students are learning, what's producing those outcomes. So schools serving mostly students of color have lower quality or fewer resources than schools serving largely white populations. And we know this to be true, not only across districts, but even within the same district. The schools serving more students of color are less likely to offer advanced courses and gifted and talented programs than schools serving mostly white students. We know from research from the Department of Education that black students with high performance in fifth grade are less likely to be placed in algebra in eighth grade. And students of color who are in schools that are located in disinvested, under-resourced communities are less likely to receive coursework targeted at grade appropriate standards, coursework that reflect higher level of cognitive demand, and coursework that's meaningfully engaging and relevant. Black and Latino students are provided less rigorous feedback 
about their work from classroom teachers than white students. Schools serving mostly students of color are more likely to be taught by out of field and novice educators than white students. Students of color are more likely to attend schools where more than half of the teachers were absent for more than 10 days. And students of color are more likely to attend schools with a police officer or a school resource officer, but not a school counselor than white students. When we look at the curriculum materials that our students are, are learning, are using as tools to learn, research has revealed that most of our US history textbooks offer a romanticized view of European experiences in the United States. But the experiences of indigenous people, of Asian and African peoples are often misrepresented or underrepresented in our school textbooks. Research has also shown this in other disciplines, in other content areas, like the natural sciences and English and language arts promote the same type of Eurocentric ideologies or ideological frames. Even when we look beyond our pre-K-12 settings, if we look into our post uh, high school experiences, we know from research that because of the lack of professors and instructors of color in many of our universities, students of color say that their points of view isn't represented and that often Western culture is considered the default standard by which all literature, architecture, film, and art are judged. We started out of three universities, NYU, Columbia, and the University of Pennsylvania, found that when students contacted professors for mentorship, faculty were more significantly more responsive to white male students than women and students of color, particularly in our private universities and, higher, and in higher paying uh, disciplines. So as we go beyond the 12th grade, and we look at, we take a P to 16 perspective on how our students, how our young people are experiencing schooling and the inequities that they're experiencing. We begin to see a different picture or a different narrative about why we might be seeing the outcomes that we're seeing when we look at our outcome data. So those were national findings. From, from school districts and school systems from across our country. But let's take a look, let's take a snapshot um, right here in Michigan in a couple of the, the metrics that we discussed a little bit earlier. When we look at the number of high school counselors in our schools um, districts across the state of Michigan, we see that for schools for whom the student body increases in the number of students of color, we see that those districts are less likely to have um, high school counselors or the number of high school counselors in those schools are significantly below school districts where the student population is anywhere between zero to a quarter of students who are students of color. So the more diverse our schools are, the less likely our high schools are to have school counselors. When we look at the number of years, right, the experiences of our teachers in Michigan, we see by this graph that as our student populations in districts across the state increase in diversity, so does the number of teachers who are only in their first or second year of teaching are in those schools as well. So our least experienced teachers tend to be in our schools 
where there are more students of color and the student population is more diverse. When we look at the average of absenteeism among our teachers in the state of Michigan, we see that for school districts where anywhere between half or third of the student population are students of color, that we see an increase in the percentage of teachers that are absent from school for more than 10 days. So when we look at the cumulative effect of these findings, both nationally and even in some metrics, when we look inside the state of Michigan, we begin to see a picture. We, be, we begin to create a narrative about how students are actually experiencing schooling in the United States. That the inequities and disparities are not only in the outcome data that we see, but also in the conditions in which students are learning. And what must be the cumulative effect of these inequities? I'll ask you to take a pause at this point and reflect on these two questions. What wowed you or surprises you or resonates with you about the data I just shared? Take about a minute or so and just reflect on that question. What wow surprises or resonates with you about the data that I just shared? Secondly, given the information shared, what do you wonder about? What questions do you have related to the implications for continuous improvement? Take a few minutes to reflect on that question. Given the information shared, what do you wonder about or what questions do you have related to implications for continuous improvement? So the inequities that we experience, the inequities that we have, both in our outcome data, right? The data uh, that we often look at in terms of achievement, discipline, school graduation, graduation rate, dropout, et cetera. And the system factors that's contributing to, in many ways, uh, the extent to which students have learning opportunities and the type of learning opportunities and the quality of those opportunities that thus affect student outcomes, such as instruction, leadership, climate, and environment. So continuous improvement is about holding up both of these sort of domains or buckets of data as we create a narrative about what school is like for many of our students, and then what do we do to address the inequities that we see. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. So we should not be surprised by the outcomes that we see, the disparities in the outcomes that we see, right? The inequities in the outcome that we see. When we look at the inequities in the experiences and the conditions that our students and educators teach and learn in every day. So let's Let's talk a little bit about what do we mean by equity-focused district improvement? What, what is equity-focused district improvement and what it is not? Equity-centered education improvement must focus on increasing opportunities, not on closing achievement gaps. So I want to say this again, so to repeat repeat the statement. That when we think about and we talk about equity-centered education improvement, equity-centered continuous improvement efforts, we focus on increasing opportunities for learning and not on closing 
achievement gaps. But in fact, the focus on achievement gap in the education discourse evades the analysis of the kind of inequities that I just shared. It evades, it distracts us from really analyzing how racism and other forms of structural oppression, whether we're talking about sexism, whether we're talking about ableism, whether we're talking about uh, heterosexism, those other systems of oppression, when we keep the conversation focused on achievement gap, it distracts us from having the conversations that we need to have, which is around dismantling systems of oppression that are contributing to the kinds of gaps in achievement that we see. While recognizing, while it is important to recognize disparities in, in student achievement, that in doing so without understanding the critical role of structural oppression, that we, that we are pointed towards short-term solutions that are likely to be sustained. And so many of those initiatives that I had in my earlier slides really pointed towards with the specific goal of closing the achievement gap. And while those gains may occur, they are often short-lived because we haven't done the hard work of dismantling structural racism, ableism, and sexism that creates the barriers to quality opportunities for learning for all students. And thus, the gains are short-lived. The gains are short-term. So if the purpose of continuous improvement then is not or should not be, or the focus should not be necessarily on closing the achievement gap, what is the focus? What should the focus be? When we think about equity-centered continuous improvement, the focus and the purpose is to create and sustain school conditions so that all students from diverse backgrounds experience affirming learning opportunities that position them as knowledge producers and enable them to graduate as critical thinkers with an appreciation and love of themselves, their communities, the larger society and the world, as well as empowered and equipped to make decisions and actions towards self-determination and positive change. When we focus on creating positive school conditions that are infirming, that engage students in positive quality learning experiences, to position students, not in ways that are def deficient or deficit, but position them as knowledge producers, right? That enables them to support their, their, their capacity to engage in critical thinking and to graduate critical thinkers who acknowledge and love and value themselves and others within their community and the larger society, we then will disrupt the, the, the gaps that we see, we then will close the gaps that we see. So the achievement gap, closing the achievement gap would be a consequence of continuous improvement efforts that's focused on creating these types of learning conditions. So I want to say that again, that the closing the achievement gap will become a consequence of the continuous improvement efforts that are focused on creating the kinds of conditions, the kinds of learning and school conditions that are affirming, that are supportive, that are critical for all students. Equity Center continuous improvement requires that we critically examine how beliefs, how our conversations and our discourse that we engage in every day, that the policies that we create and develop and enact, and the practices that we engage create conditions in which students learn and contribute to the outcomes that we want to see. And improvement activities 
intentionally focus on reducing systemic barriers and increasing equitable access to quality learning for all students. By surfacing first and then redressing marginalizing policies and practices. So specifically, continuous equity-centered continuous improvement aims to redress marginalizing policies and practices by first surfacing and examining policies that are, that are in fact marginalizing practices that are in fact marginalizing and then to address those policies and practices. Equity-centered continuous improvement aims to redistribute resources as well as access to and participation in opportunities so that all students, regardless of their background, regardless of their zip code, regardless of their identities, have access to, and not only access to, but are actually participating in quality learning opportunities. Continuous improvement efforts should aim to recognize and value differences, and this recognition and acknowledgement is reflected in our policies and our practices and our learning content, our pedagogy and assessment methods. And that we are ensuring within our equity-centered continuous improvement efforts that there's representation in educational decision-making. So beyond, we wanna move beyond school improvement to school transformation. So what do we mean by transformation, right? So we look to the definition to provide us an understanding of what we mean by transformation. And transformation is defined as a thorough and dramatic change in form, function, and appearance. So this means that we do more than sort of tweak, right, what we're doing every day. It means that we engage in actual change in what we do and how we do it. And teaching and learning should look different, should feel different, and should sound different than what we have been doing that have proved to be marginalizing to particular groups of students. So this is not to say that we just stop doing everything that we've been doing. This is not to say that we have not been engaged in equitable quality practices in our schools, in our districts. Of course we have. And for those practices, for those policies that are supportive and inclusive, for those practices that ensures that there's equitable access to opportunities for the environments and the learning in the classrooms and instructional practices that we use are creating equitable, inclusive, quality learning experiences. We hold on to those practices. We, contain, we continue to implement and employ those practices. We sustain those practices and we grow those practices to scale. But for those practices, those policies, the rhetoric and the discourse that we're having, that doesn't do those things, that don't do those things, then we, we leave those aside. We stop engaging those practices and we engage in new and different practices and policies and procedures. We transform what we're doing. I wanna situate this idea of systems transformation into two primary concepts. One is around centering educational equity, and the second is around cultivating the culture of learning, of a learning organization. So this is a definition of educational equity that we use at the Midwestern Plains Equity Assistance Center. And we define educational equity as a ideal, a destination, if you will, that we're focused on um, where policies and practices and interactions and resources are representative of, constructed by, and responsive to all people in the school community so that each person has access to, can meaningfully participate, and has positive outcomes from high quality learning and working experiences regardless of individual characteristics or group membership. And so we provide this definition as both the vision of equity that we're striving for, but also as the pathway or blueprint to realize that vision. 
Within this definition are four core constructs. The first one is that of access. Our continuous improvement activities should focus on ensuring that there's access to learning opportunities and decision making for all adults and for all children in the school community. And this access, this by access, we mean entree and involvement and the ability to benefit from the opportunities that are in place. So access is more than just availability. Access goes beyond what's available, but it actually speaks to what are the structures that may be preventing people from participating in opportunities that may be available. Representation, that is having presence, right? Having presence in decision-making processes, as well as in the context and content of what our students are learning and what our teachers are teaching. Our young people need to see themselves in the curricular materials that they're learning. They need to see their, their identities, their perspective, their lived experiences, their legacies, their history, their heritage, as well as learning about others. So the content should be both a mirror as well as a window to learning experiences and lived experiences of themselves and others. That having access and being represented is not enough if our educators, if our adults in our school community and our children don't have the opportunity to meaningfully participate in the learning environment, in the schooling experience. And, and what that means is really demonstrating their agency and our power to contribute in effectual ways. So what they say, what they do, how they feel matters and counts and helps to shape the school community. And lastly, this will all be for naught if we're not experiencing how high outcomes, that is solutions that really benefit all students and all adults. And these four constructs are meant to be a gestalt, are meant to work together um, in, in dynamic ways, in reciprocal ways, and that in synergistic ways. And by working, by these concepts working together, the outcome of these constructs is greater than the sum of its parts, right? So that we experience a, 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 a reality of equity that goes beyond these individual, what we, can, what we could possibly achieve by focusing on these individual concepts by themselves, but what we can only realize and achieve if we realize these, all four of these constructs together. Educational improvement efforts to focus on transforming school systems into equity-centered learning organizations. At its foundation, a learning organization is one in which people within the organization have a commitment to continuous improvement at all levels, at the classroom, school, district, and state. And what's so critical about cultivating a culture of uh, a learning organization culture is that then when we are asked to learn something new, to engage in a new practice, to take on a new policy, that we understand and we position ourselves as learners to acquire and to expand and grow our capacity. And so it's easier to engage in change. It's easier to engage in improvements. It's easier to let go of practices and beliefs that have been holding us back from realizing equity for all. If we understand ourselves individually and as an organization, as a system, as a system of learners and an organization that is steep in learning, that we, we strive to learn better so that we can do better. Being an equity-centered learning organization requires that we cultivate this, this culture of inquiry, of critical inquiry, and that we do so in, in, in reflection of ourselves, understanding that each of us individually should engage in that self, 
critical inquiry process about ourselves and our own practices and our own beliefs, as well as the system. The individuals make up the system and that the system support individuals in cultivating a sense of inquiry, a sense of wonder, a sense of learning. Critical examination is both a personal endeavor as well as a systemic one. So on the personal level, we engage in, in continuous self-questioning to raise our awareness about how, how our own identities inform our understanding of, the, of experiences and complex social problems. We have to understand ourselves as social, cultural beings with multiple intersecting identities. And our identities shape how we view the world, it shapes how we view ourselves in the world and how we view each other. We understand that our identities, our experiences come with various different biases. And so we're vigilant about interrogating those biases so that we are not manifesting those biases in the policies that we create and the practices that we engage in. That we examine the power dynamics that are at play within our classrooms, within our schools, whether our classrooms are face-to-face, in-person, brick and mortar, or whether they are virtual and online. In our district, in our state agencies, that we examine those power dynamics that maintain oppressive and marginalizing realities for particular groups. That we're vigilant about that ongoing examination and that we work towards surfacing those dynamics that are oppressing groups of people are down oppressing individuals and holding them back. And that we understand the social historical context and how that context, how our past, it's never really our past, that we're dealing with the legacy of our past, even today, and how they show up in every day, the details of everyday life. And so when we talk about slavery, when we talk about um, uh, Jim Crow laws and segregation, when we talk about policies and practices such as redlining um, that kept our indigenous and black and Latinx communities separate and located in, re- in communities that were then um, sort of stripped of their resources, right? That while those same redlining policies are not necessarily in place today, that we're still living with the impact of those policies today, right? Um, Where we know that although many of the issues that civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s and 70s in relationship to civil rights, racial civil rights, and civil rights for people with disabilities and civil rights for people um, who identify as a part of the LGBTQ community and civil rights for indigenous communities. When we, we know that we are dealing with, while those movements were in the past, that we are dealing with the legacy of those conditions and we are seeing the resurgence of those movements even today. And so this requires us to really engage in this sort of transformative shifts or changes. I'm going to identify three key shifts and practices for leadership. One is that we recognize the learning is culturally mediated and is a social process. So teaching and learning is not culturally neutral. It's not, we can't locate it and isolate it within an individual cognitive process, but instead it is socially mediated, it is culturally mediated. That we openly acknowledge and appreciate and accept differences, and differences are contributions to our learning community. That we view differences as positive, and we view differences as ways of enriching our classrooms and our schools. And that we reframe and refocus improvement efforts away from blaming students and communities and families, away from fixing students and families towards creating more responsive systems. 
So at this time, we'd like you to take a few minutes to ponder and to reflect on, again, what wows or surprises or what resonates with you about how equity-centered continuous improvement is reframed away from the goal of closing the achievement gap toward the goal of dismantling systemic barriers to learning. So what resonates with you about that idea, about that concept of reframing the purpose of continuous improvement away from closing the achievement gap as its ultimate purpose, but towards dismantling systemic barriers to learning opportunities as its core purpose. Take a minute and reflect on that. Next, given the information shared, what do you wonder about? What questions do you have related to the implications for how you frame continuous improvement efforts in your own local setting? If we're no longer centering improvement efforts on the, the specific and expressed goal of closing the achievement gap, we, 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 we frame that to the goal of dismantling systemic barriers. And as a consequence of dismantling those barriers, we will see the closing of achievement gaps. We will see those inequities and disparities in student outcome data disappear as we address the inequities and disparities and the conditions in which students are learning, right, as we address those barriers. What does that mean for how you then frame continuous improvement efforts in your local district, in your local school, in your respective settings? Okay, so moving to this sort of wrapping, wrapping this all up. So how do we put this all together, right? And what is then transformative leadership for equity look like? And what are those, act, what are those specific activities or actions that as leaders um, you engage in to promote this sort of transformation or transformative perspective and framing of continuous improvement that centers educational equity? The transformative leadership for educational equity focuses on causing change in individuals and systems. So you're working on supporting individuals within your system to engage in the necessary change and transformation, transformative work as individuals, but also as a system working together to then transform the system to be a system that disrupts and dismantles those normative beliefs that we have about particular groups, about particular identities, that prove to be marginalizing to people, that prove to create or contribute to the creation of barriers to accessing resources and opportunities. The transformative leadership creates valuable and positive change in people and in systems with the end goal of mobilizing efforts towards equity and education justice. So as a, as a leader engaging in continuous improvement, transformative activities that you're wanting to, or you're cultivating and cre you're creating positive, opportunities for positive change in individuals, in your students, in your educators, in your staff, in your families and caregivers of the school community, with the end goal of mobilizing efforts towards equity and education justice. So there are four specific activities toward leading equity-centered transformative change in our school community. First, Collecting and analyzing both systems and outcome data. Second, critically examining policies, people, and practices 
in terms of the extent to which they are creating either pathways towards opportunities or barriers towards opportunities. Holding time and space for critical dialogue. And lastly, but I, I wanna say, maybe not the most important, but certainly um, integral towards leading uh, for, for transformative change is demonstrating equity-centered, anti-racist, anti-oppression leadership through your communication, through what you communicate as a leader, right? Both in verbal and written communication, both in rhetoric and discourse, your commitment to persistent and passionate advocacy and support for equity, and that this commitment is consistent across time, across locations, across audiences, across initiatives, across goals, across strategies. That equity, century equity becomes the, the central goal in how you are engaging in continuous improvement activities in your district, in your schools. So let's start with the first one, the collecting data. So critical inquiry process requires that we examine both student outcome data. And so we, we often look at our outcome data. So our achievement test scores, our graduation rates, student, student absenteeism, suspension expulsion rates, grade retention and dropout. They so were looking at these data, but these data only tell us half the story. These data are only part of the equation. Right, these data really tells us the output or the outcome of what and how students are experiencing schooling every day. And so while we look at our outcome data, we must also examine our, what I wanna call our input data, right, or our systemic data, our data that helps us understand the context in which our students are learning and which our educators are teaching, right, the conditions. So we look at participation rate in various different high-level courses of many of our students. So what exposure, what experience, what opportunities are our students having to engage in high-level learning experiences? We look at and we collect data, we create systems to help us collect data to assess educators' expectations educated expectations and the, the, uh, the rigor of particular instructional practices and standards. Then we actually look at our students' exposure to in-field and experience effective educators. And we identify not only the gaps in, in uh, student academic achievement, but the gaps in students' opportunities to be taught by experienced effective teachers that we look at the exposure of our students to effective school leaders, right? We think about diversity among our educators. Do our students see themselves in the educators that are teaching them? Do we have that same kind of diversity? Do our educators reflect our students, our student population? They we examine how we're funding schools, not just across the state, not just across school districts, but even within our districts in terms of the kinds of funds and supports the various schools receive within the district. That, that we look at teacher workforce stability. What, what is the turnover rate for teachers? Are, are students experiencing two or three or four teachers within a school year? What's the consistency, right? What about resource allocation? Teacher attendance the type of social emotional care and resources that are available to students, and the selection of curriculum materials. Again, going back to representation, are students seeing themselves and learning about themselves through curriculum materials as well as learning about others? These are the inputs. These are the elements and the data that we need to know in order to help us understand better the experiences our students are having that's contributing to the outcomes that we're seeing. We examine these data through 
thinking about the people within our system, gathering information, gathering data from our students, from our families, community members, from our educators, and from our state and district and school leaders. We are gathering information about the dispositions that are, that are demonstrated, the skills and competencies and knowledge that our stakeholders have, that our educators have, that our students have to co-create learning experiences, to co-create knowledge, to co-create conditions that our students are, are, are learning in. They were examining, we collect data about the impact of policy at the classroom level, so classroom policies, as well as school district and state policies. And that we engage in in-depth analysis of practices that we engage in on a day-to-day -day basis, from curriculum materials that are selected and used to instruction, moment-to-moment -moment instructional decisions that are made and the ways in which we are interacting with our students and our families. That we're holding space and time for critical dialogue. To what extent are we engaging as school leaders opportunities for to establish a shared vision about equity? that there's clarity and a shared understanding about our desired outcomes among all members of the school community, that the vision is promoting an anti-racist, anti-oppression vision for the school community. And to what extent are, is there opportunity and time and space held for these kinds of discussions to ensure the shared vision across our multiple stakeholders in our school communities? To what extent are we holding time and space for critical dialogue that the center's equity in the content of the work. To what extent are we making overt connections, right, to all district and school de decisions and initiatives and programs to our continuous improvement activities and our, that our continuous improvement activities are meaningful, are comprehensible, not only to ourselves as school leaders, but also to our faculty, to our staff, to our students, to our families and to our community members. And that our goals, our continuous improvement goals, are both are aspirational, right? Um, that we inspire to be bigger and better than where we are and where we are now. And that we are unapologetic in centering goals and objectives that are anti-racist and anti-oppression. That we're holding time and space for critical dialogue that is inclusive of multiple and diverse perspectives, where the voices and experiences of minoritized groups, so these are groups that have been historically marginalized in our country, are centered, that we push back and we resist deficit narratives about minoritized groups. And when these narratives are surfaced, that we highlight them, that we challenge them, and that we reframe them. And that we engage in critical discussion about the inequities that we are that we identify and that we are noting and the inputs, right? Those input data that I talked about just a few minutes ago, as well as examining our output. And that lastly, we engage in data dialogue, where data pre um, our data presentations or how we represent data facilitate discourse that really challenges the status quo assumptions. That we're using multiple data sources, both qualitative data and quantitative data are collected, analyzed, and represented. While our quantitative data may tell us what issues are, where the gaps are, it is, our, it is through the stories and the narratives and the qualitative data that we gain nuance and texture in these stories to help us get a better and deeper understanding about what students and about what teachers and administrators are experiencing in schools every day. That diverse members of the school communities are involved in interpreting and making meaning of those data. And that we're engaged in critical questioning in order to surface the narratives that are being constructed by specific groups and how and we're thinking about how we are discussing the data and how we are interpreting the data. With the ultimate question being asked, who's benefiting from the way data are being presented? Who's benefiting from the way data are being interpreted? And are we using data as a tool 
to help us understand what the systemic barriers are and how then to address them. What may help us in sort of engaging in these continuous improvement efforts, the continuous improvement activities are both large and big and, and come in the form of a strategic planning and continuous improvement planning, but there are also those moment to moment decisions that we make at the classroom level, at the school level, within the various offices and, and departments within our districts and state agency. So what may help us is to think about employing an equity-centered decision framework that can provide us a way of really um, facilitating and enhancing decision-making by providing conceptual structure and principles for centering the equity constructs that I just talked through and decisions that are made around economics or fiscal decisions, around our social interactions, the sort of ecosystems in which we are teaching and learning, the institutional dimensions of the decisions that we're making every day. So I propose to you um, this decision-making sort of framework. And we use the four constructs of equity that were embedded in our equity, educational equity definition. So we asked these four questions related to access, representation, meaningful participation, and high outcomes for all. Does or did our decision or action create pathways for accessing resources and opportunities for youth and adults in our school community? Or did our decisions or actions create barriers to accessing resources and opportunities for youth and adults in our school communities, particularly for those who are, historic, who are historically marginalized. Was our decision or action informed by and relative and reflective of diverse viewpoints and representative of our school communities by at least, by our entire school community, or at least by those of the school communities most indirectly affected by the particular decision or action that was made? Does or did our decision or action enable members of our school community to meaningfully participate in learning or decision-making opportunities, or, or, or did it create barriers? And lastly, does or did our decision or actions move all students, particularly historically marginalized students, closer to quality opportunities and the possibility of achieving outcomes or further away. So this, these four questions can be used as sort of a barometer as we engage in this continuous improvement activities, continuous improvement actions and decisions to help us gauge whether we are in fact centering equity in the decisions that we're making. Our last wow and wonder prompt. What continuous improvement activities toward leading equity-centered transformation most resonate with you? Take a few minutes and reflect on that question. And then secondly, given the information shared, what do you wonder about? What questions surface for you about facilitating continuous improvement activities for leading equity-centered transformation? Take a few seconds and reflect on that question. What, what, what do you wonder about or what questions surface for you about facilitating continuous improvement activities for leading equity-centered transformation? So as we wrap up, as I wrap up my opening remarks around the work, what is transformative equity-centered work? What is the work for leading 
equity-centered continuous improvement, I leave you with, with, with these ideas or these thoughts. That this work is messy, right? Uh, this work is complex. Um, this work is full of seemingly tensions that we have to work through and struggle through to realize the outcomes that we want. The transformational equity-centered work is both intentional and organic. So we do not realize equity by accident, that we have to be purposeful about our efforts. We have to be purposeful about continuous improvement. Continuous improvement in and of itself will not necessarily lead to equitable outcomes unless we're intentionally centering equity in our continuous improvement efforts. And that while we're being purposeful, that often through the imagination, the creativity that comes out of continuous improvement work, informed by our data, also facilitates this sort of organic production and co-creation of, of understanding and of knowledge. The equity-centered work is metacognitive. Well, what I mean by that is that equity is about thinking about how we think about things, right? So it's how we perceive a particular issue. It's thinking about how we think about and how we make meaning of data that we have. It's thinking about how we think about gathering and collecting those data. What systems do we have in place? So equity work is very metacognitive. But equity work is also emotional, right? It also is very personal. So it's not only about how we think about the work, but it's also how we feel about the work as well, how we feel about equity, how we feel about understanding and realizing that many of the practices and policies that we have enacted, and maybe with good intentions and positive intentions, that in fact the impact of those intentions are really harmful to particular groups of students. And so, and that, and that evokes particular tensions and it evokes emotion. And so this work is really about working through that emotion to understand that we did what we did when we knew with the information that we had at the time, but as we know better, as we gain more insight, as we listen to the perspectives and voices of various stakeholders and various communities, that we learn better, and then as we learn better, we do better. The equity work is necessarily biological, meaning that this is about how we talk about education. It requires that we talk with each other. It requires that we dialogue with our students, with our families and caregivers, with our community members, with our educators and faculty, with our staff, both certified and non-certified, with our building leaders, with our district leaders, with our, our state agencies, that we dialogue, that we engage in discourse with each other, and that it's ongoing. But it also requires that we're introspective, that at times we must engage in self-quiet self-reflection about our own role in either maintaining systems of oppression in the ways in which we may be complicit in sustaining and maintaining systems of oppression, and how we then interrupt and disrupt those practices, both at a personal level and at a systems level. That we have to engage in strategies that are both critical, meaning that we're taking a look at, and we're examining the, the, the power dynamics that are, that are sustaining various different marginalizing structures, but that we're also thinking about the context in which various different strategies and decisions are, are being made. So a particular action or decision may work in school A, given the student population, the community, the school community of school A, but may not work in school B. It may work in district a, but may not work in District B, may work in the northern part of the state, but may not work in the southern part of the state. So we understand that the work 
have to be contextual and reflect the, 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 the conditions and communities of the members within that environment. And then yes, there are technical solutions that can be applied to address some of the inequities that we identify, but that those technical solutions cannot be overlaid on top of systems where we have not engaged in the contextual and critical work that's necessary. Otherwise, we're doomed to sort of replicate and reproduce the kind of inequities that we're trying to address. That again, this work is both personal and systemic, and that ultimately, continuous improvement efforts must be actionable, not only by district and school leaders, but also by our classroom teachers, our faculty, our related service personnel, our staff, and our students. So as we enter into the fall, and we come out of a very challenging summer and spring, we use this opportunity to reimagine what schooling could be. We use this opportunity to move beyond school improvement to school transformation. I leave you with these four sort of assertions. The equity-centered continuous improvement allows us to reclaim education for ourselves and for our students and for our families. To reclaim it in a way that speaks to and is responsive to and reflects the lived experiences, the wonderful assets and enrichment of the diversity that we see within our schools, in our districts, across the state, from racial diversity to diversity related to disability, to diversity related to our gender identities and expression, to our diversity related to ethnicity, to social economic diversity, to a diversity that are within our cities and suburbs, within our small towns and rural communities that we reclaim, that we identify, that we revitalize our communities in a way that provides a rebirth and energy that we reimagine school and schooling to something that is new, something that is different, something that is inclusive. And then we, we commit to this idea of education, of public pre-K-16 education really being for all students, that all students can do and will benefit from enriched, supportive, responsive, affirming, and rigorous school communities that centers equity and that reflects the identities and multiple identities that we all have, those identities that we share, and then those identities that um, reflect this diversity within the human experience. I thank you for this opportunity. I know you're going to enjoy this conference. Thank you and have a great day.